Okay. Good afternoon to the uh, asteroid observation session at the uh, asteroid workshop. Very pleased to have you here. Uh, for those online, you can follow along at the website www.nasa.gov slash asteroid workshop. You can use the chat version there. You can also follow along on the uh, hashtag find asteroids. Uh, to start us off, we have Lindley Johnson from NASA headquarters. Lindley, go ahead. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, I, uh, first of all, I want to apologize for not being down there in person. I had an illness in September, which I'm still not uh, quite able to travel yet. But in the spirit of, uh, of the virtual world, uh, I will uh, uh, be participating in this virtually, as uh, many others across, uh, across the country will be. Um, are be uh, uh, assisted uh, with uh, uh, Paul Abel, who is uh, down at Johnson Space Center, part of the Astro Materials uh, Group uh, down there, working um, uh, near Earth uh, object uh, uh, issues. Also, Paul Chodis uh, uh, will be uh, uh, helping us out. Paul Chodis is from the uh, NEO program office out at uh, JPL. And I also want to thank our moderator, Pedro Lopez, uh, He's going to be keeping us on track and uh, uh, helping us out with uh, uh, some of the virtual participation. I want to make this pretty quick and introductory uh, so we can get into the presentations uh, because we're going to be uh, moving through them uh, pretty quickly. We've got a lot to uh, cover this afternoon, so you can kind of think about it like the uh, shark tank for asteroid observation. Um, as uh, many of you are aware, and, uh, or should be aware, the NASA Near-Earth Object Observation Program has uh, been in existence for some 15 years now, uh, using uh, a, a good many uh, uh, mainly ground, but some space-based assets. Uh, we have discovered over 10,000 uh, near-Earth objects uh, uh, to date. Uh, the Minor Planet Center uh, up at uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, plays an important role. Uh, central node role for uh, obtaining observations on uh, these objects from around the world. And then the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, Program Office uh, does the more precision orbit determination and assistance with uh, other aspects uh, of the program. Uh, in looking at the RFI responses, uh, of which we had some, uh, some 90 uh, responses to the uh, observations uh, call. Uh, we uh, uh, looked at these from the aspect of we wanted to hear new ideas and uh, and investigate areas that uh, hadn't been uh, hadn't been looked at as much b before. So there were a lot of responses, of course, from folks that uh, have been involved uh, with the near Earth object uh, uh, business for quite some time. Folks that we already work with and were aware of what they were doing. Uh, so we didn't choose uh, a number of those responses, uh, albeit all they were uh, highly rated. But since we're already working with them, we really uh, wanted to see new input. So what uh, we invited here today were presentations from uh, from folks uh, from around the world, actually, uh, that uh, might have some new ideas for us, uh, and uh, invited the most promising, what we thought would be, would be the most promising uh, of those new inputs. Uh, moving through these, we kind of start with uh, some of the um, amateur or really what I would consider semi-pro folks uh, uh, from around the world uh, that uh, are capable of doing asteroid observations, uh, and then move along to some of the more capable assets, uh, both in uh, size of aperture or instrumentation or capability and techniques. Uh, we'll get into using use of uh, radars and, and and potentially even uh, LIDAR uh, capabilities. And then uh, the session kind of ends up with more moving towards space-based capabilities and, and looking at what can be done there from a characterization or precursor mission aspect, although uh, some of those areas may be more costly than, um, than what we are envisioning right now. Uh, so um, with that, uh, Paul, do you have anything uh, that you wanted to add? Uh, nothing. Uh, just for a reminder for people in the room, if they could please uh, mute or turn their cell phones to vibrate, that would be very appreciated. And with that, Lindley, I, I think we can get started. Okay. Well, uh, we um, 
uh, are going to move through these fairly quickly. As I said, uh, we've allocated uh, 10 minutes for each presentation, uh, eight minutes uh, for the uh, speaker to uh, present their idea, and then uh, two minutes uh, for questions uh, from, from us and, and from the audience. Um, uh, so with that, uh, let's, get, uh, let's get started. Okay, if we could have the first, first. Uh, presenter is uh, Phil Belfry. It's Belfry, and uh, he looks so peaceful. <laughs> A few years ago, my good friend Dan told me the excellent story of his trip to see one of the last shuttle launches with his two boys, I think ages four and six at the time. He traveled from the San Francisco Bay Area to Florida. He pushed his kids around in a double stroller so they could sleep during the long overnight pass through security, and then finally the morning rocket launch happened. From that day on, the shuttle, NASA, and the space program became a constant topic at their house, and I can only assume Dan is thinking, yeah, that trip started a fire in my kids and it was so worth it. My proposal is about engaging more amateur astronomers in the, cap in the process of capturing minor planet light curve data. I understand there are only a couple hundred folks worldwide performing these observations today. But even more so, my proposal is about engaging people to become amateur astronomers by exciting them about the asteroid initiative. I think the opportunity to contribute, to do real science, to submit real observations to NASA is what my friend and people like him can use to start and keep that fire burning in themselves and their kids. So what do they need to get started? It's true that hardware capable of capturing light curves, telescopes and mounts, science capable CCD cameras, filters, etc., is already available to those with generous budgets, as are the software tools for controlling the image capture process, performing image analysis, and for submitting the data to the Minor Planet Center for integration with other observations. But there are a couple of limitations to existing tools and methods. First, the cost is out of reach of many who may otherwise have the interest and knowledge to pursue this work. The cost of a minimal hardware configuration certainly exceeds $10,000. Second, the overall process for capturing and analyzing necessary images is technically difficult and requires a substantial learning curve and a refined technique to be successful. Even gathering the knowledge to get started is non-trivial and requires substantial reading and becoming familiar with a number of internet resources. So today the process is expensive and somewhat difficult, but I think there are ways of reducing the cost, perhaps to an amount not much different than what Dan paid for the trip with his kids. I suggest that low-cost telescopes, mounts, and camera hardware already exist that may be up to the task of capturing light curve data with sufficient fidelity, and that a list of adequately performing, properly vetted hardware systems should be created and maintained so interested beginners have an easy way to identify the right equipment. And regarding the software and internet tools, I think if the easy parts of the process are made as automatic and as simple as possible, the accessibility of the tools can greatly improve. Creating a suite of easy-to-use tools that are properly tuned to work with the tested hardware can result in an off-the-shelf system that lets the interested amateur focus on advancing his knowledge and technique, knowing that his hardware and software equipment is up to the task right out of the box. Making available these choices of hardware and software systems that have been proven to work well creates a great branding opportunity, and this is really the heart of my proposal, to call these systems science ready or some such. I can imagine my friend Dan going into a telescope store shopping online and having a choice between purchasing a telescope for general observing or purchasing a science ready system, good not only for visual observing but also for contributing to the asteroid initiative. The latter choice will no doubt still be more expensive with a steeper learning curve, but with the opportunity to do real science and really contribute, I think I know what choice he'd make. And it's not only individuals that might be interested. I can't imagine a project that better integrates the STEM education principles, science, technology, engineering, and math, than learning and then practicing light curve capture and analysis. Maybe our high schools can supply much of the manpower that my proposal suggests is out there. So what sort of low-cost telescope hardware might work well? Just as an example, both Celestron and Mead, the two most popular brands of consumer scopes, make flat field telescopes that can be outfitted with a hyperstar lens that converts these scopes into an F2 optical system. Combined with the newest model CCD camera, can resolve in a system capable of light curve imaging, certainly one adequate for brighter objects. One of our research goals should be to determine the magnitude limits for certain system configurations and to also determine what sky darkness and sky quality is likewise necessary. If you're familiar with the cost of the above ventured items, you know that I'm already over my intended budget. Clearly, another part of this project must be to entice vendors to create special products and pricing to make these systems affordable. Serious astroimagers spend a lot of money on telescope mounts capable of sub-arc second tracking over many minutes and rely on permanent observatory installations to ensure that their equatorial mounts remain properly aligned. But the mechanical precision necessary to make this work just isn't affordable enough. So one possible alternative, again, just as an example, might be creating an all-in-one imaging accessory 
that combines an off-axis guider, refractive active optics unit, and field rotator that can compensate not only for mount tracking errors, but also allow using an alt as mount instead of an equatorial mount. This approach of using digital hardware and some witty software to substitute a low cost, relatively low precision device for a much higher cost and precision method can possibly be applied in other ways to help reduce overall system cost. In any case, adding friendly features like auto aligning, auto pointing, and pointing correction can make using a telescope, even for visual observing, much easier for beginners. And these features are made possible only when a camera and astrometric software become a standard part of the system. If left to my own efforts, I plan to pursue this project in three phases, but it would be wonderful to see these ideas developed by organizations with greater resources than my own. Phase one, assemble and test possible low-cost hardware configurations by performing light curve imaging and analysis using existing methods and software tools. This, this experience should provide a clear understanding of the real costs and real limitations of the existing components. During phase two, the information gleaned from the previous phase will be organized and presented as a website for review and vetting by anyone interested. Any additional required software components um, or software that makes part of the process much easier will be designed and implemented and tested as part of this phase. Hopefully some vendors will be interested enough to add their suggestions to the process and maybe even design new products to fill in the gaps. And phase three, actively seek the support and cooperation of equipment vendors and resellers with the intent of creating low-cost hardware configurations that meet the standards identified in phases one and two. Resale efforts and a science-ready branding can be established to promote these systems and, if appropriate, a NASA Asteroid Initiative tie-in. In wrapping up, I'd like to mention an article from this month's Sky and Telescope magazine titled The Great Supernova Race. It's, r it's more or less about amateur efforts to discover supernovas, which has gotten a lot harder because the professional sky surveys are so darn effective. The article says that in 1999, amateurs discovered about 78% of all new supernovas, but then in 2012, that percentage had dropped to 15%. Maybe that percentage will soon be close to zero. I hope that the Asteroid Initiative will seek to embrace the efforts of amateurs as much as possible, rather than compete with them. Not because amateurs will do a better job, certainly let's help them do the best job possible, but because the ability to do real science and contribute to the Asteroid Initiative will fire their imaginations and, I think, revitalize everyone's interest in space. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Do we have any uh, questions from anybody in the room? At the back? We have uh, two mic runners, Wendy and Alma. Question in the back? Just be patient um, while we uh, send the mic runners to you. Raise your hand and they will come find you. And on, online, uh, just be patient. We'll um, take your questions. And okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Prioritize your needs um, to move this type of work ahead. What would they be? Well, I, I think it's really. Re I, I, I think two things e equal are equally important. One really is reducing the cost, um, and then the second one is is simply making it pretty easy. If you've looked at the minor, if you've looked at the Minor Planet Center website, it's fantastic, but it's a little bit hard to use. I think making it friendlier will will take that part of the burden out of the system anyway. Okay. Anything else? Any, any other questions in the room? Any? I have one. Okay, we have How one. about ideas for fast response? Fast response, because we often only have days if we have a really <coughs> small asteroid coming by. So I'm just wondering if there are ideas that we can make this uh, very quick. Uh, well, efforts. certainly with a larger body of people interested yes. in, in attacking it, this, that would be fantastic. The more yeah. people you got, the more open eyes you're going to have. I think it's an excellent idea. Have you had any interaction with any of the uh, commercial? Telescope makers, Celestron, et cetera, so um, far? I, I have, uh, not regarding this topic. This all came about quite quickly since July 18th and then, of course, a month later. But I will be seeing many of these people at the Advanced Imaging Conference in Santa Clara this next uh, two weekends from now. So I, I plan on bringing it up. And this is a certainly great launching platform for discussion for that. OK, thank you, Phil. Thank you very much. We can have the next speaker, please. Next speaker is Douglas Walker from the University of Canterbury. And he will be talking to us about using amateur astronomers for follow-up observations from the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, again, just a reminder for, for people virtually, we will be uh, taking your questions. Uh, you can use the chat uh, session on the website, www.nasa.gov slash asteroid workshop, or on the hashtag find asteroids. Hi, good afternoon. My name's Douglas Walker, so here's the outline of my talk. But before I get started on that, I'll give you a, just a brief background of who we are. The University of Canterbury is located in Christchurch, New Zealand. We're on the South Island. We've got about 15,000 students in the uh, student body. We have a very strong pro graduate program in physics and astronomy. 
We have an observatory site out at Mount John Observatory, which is located almost 44 degrees south latitude. It's in what they call the Southern Alps of the uh, Southern Island. For this um, proposal, we've got two U.S. entities we're in partnerships with. Qualtech Incorporated is a high-tech engineering firm specializing in mission readiness, project management, documentations and training, and also we've been talking to the University of Arizona Imaging Technology Lab. So, so we all what the problem is, is that we want to find additional candidate sets for the asteroid return mission. Um, with an absolute brightness of about 27 to 31 that corresponds to a size of anywhere from about four to seven meters. So the um, middle bullet I'm put in there to say I haven't completely ignored the uh, grand uh, challenge mission, but uh, this talk here is really focused on the, um, on the asteroid mission itself. So the chart at the bottom here I've generated to help us with the talk in the next few slides, which is showing the absolute magnitude over here on the uh, left axis there as a function of uh, distance of the asteroid away from the observer. And I make some simplifying assumptions where the um, asteroid distance is outside the Earth orbit there. And I've plotted here several points on here which is showing the limiting magnitudes across the bottom where I'm saying that amateurs can generally get to limiting magnitude about 18 or 19. Advanced amateurs, if they're really good, can get to the limiting magnitude about 20. And beyond that, you've got your professional systems. So in the band right here from 27 to 31, for the new detection of new asteroids in the size frame we're after, it's really the professional systems is what um, are the playing in. So one of the problems we see now is finding it, um, and being able to add additional asteroids to that um, candidate set is that with the um, loss of uh, funding for Siding Springs at the end, middle of this year, there's really, in Australia, there's really no dedicated Southern Hemisphere Observatory dedicated to asteroid detection follow-up. Professor Trestra at the University of Conception in Chile made a comment back in March saying because of no Southern Hemisphere um, dedicated asteroid system, up to 40% of the NEAs could go undetected. And the charts here showing on the right is this PanStars coverage chart, and this is the uh, reports coming in in 2012 is showing you that, yes, indeed, the um, majority of reports are coming from the Northern Hemisphere. So, so our approach is a three-pronged solution approach to try to help solve this problem, we're saying you need to image longer, wider, and deeper. So what do we mean by imaging longer? So we're saying take the current systems and capability at the Mount John facility and enhance those. We do have some uh, follow-up observations going on at Mount John, but it's ad hoc. There's nothing really dedicated in place. So uh, I've broken this down in proposed solutions near term and longer term. Near term support the um, schedule launch in the 2017-18 time frame. We're saying you can increase the observing time on the current systems we have, upgrade your imaging systems, and possibly even look at installing an atlas type system at the Mount John Observatory itself. So for increasing observing time, we have um, <coughs> capability for observing of uh, one meter and six, uh, point six meter telescope or follow up. We do have a 1.8 meter telescope there that we have a possible shared use of that. For camera upgrades, we can either go a commercial camera upgrade, or we really like to propose building a um, specialized detector, and this is where the University of Arizona comes in. They build specialized detector, and they've got uh, for their telescope systems all over the world, as this map on the right here shows. So, now they only build a detector, it's not the complete camera. So that's just where UFC engineering and the physics and uh, astronomy department comes in. We've built cameras for our other systems out at the observatory site in years past. So, and in the 2015 time frame, Atlas is now coming online from the University of Hawaii. We're saying we've got the real estate down there. Maybe you want to consider putting a um, facility down in the southern hemisphere. For longer term, if you want a full uh, observatory down in the southern hemisphere, maybe even consider a PanStar. It's called a PanStar 3, you know. The focus here would be on strict uh, cost control and construction. Don't try to implement or in improve the system, just build it to print. The second prong we're talking about here is involving others. This is where the amateurs come in. So uh, we know the amateurs have a proven record of contributing. Now if I show you the chart over here again, which I'm showing you just a while ago, the, um, for the amateurs actually to come into play here, the asteroids have to be really close in. And so there's a little time for characterization after discovery. So our proposed solution here is to leverage off a current system we have in place down in the southern hemisphere across New Zealand, Australia, and the South Pacific realm. It's this microfund network, and that is a network put in place for amateurs to follow up for microlensing events of extra exoplanet uh, research. So we're saying, you know, expand that with training, uh, recruitment, and support. UFC College of Science Outreach would be your project management for that. They've done this since 1999, and this is where Qualtech comes in. They would actually look at developing training, both tools, both online and hardware type training material, and also developing a web-based interface with the rapid response system by interfacing into existing databases. 
Okay, the final product we're saying you need to image deeper. Okay, so uh, current detection approaches are really interframe linking type system. They're simple and robust, but we don't think they really exploit the full extent of imaging data. If you look at my chart right here on the, on the right, if you can stack 50 images on top of one another by doing imaging stacking, you can get to two magnitude or uh, two um, um, levels lower and limiting magnitude. So in my chart here is showing you that what that actually does is shift of all these points upward and now you can see the amateurs actually come back and play into the detection game. So this is bringing the amateurs back into the detection game. So, so how do you go about doing that? We're saying you need to link, link together what they call difference imaging algorithms with a modified co-addition. Different imaging algorithms is basically taking the differences from one image to another, looking for very low um, uh, faint objects and, and signal noise, very crowded fields. We use this technique now for looking for um, subdwarf pulsators in galactic clusters inside the global plane. Um, and uh, along with that, you would generate this um, modified co-addition, which is doing um, probabilistic methods for generating the shift vectors that you have to take in play to be able to stack the images together. For uh, any a recovery, you would limit your um, search space based on uh, previous reports. For new detections, it's a harder problem because you've got a larger search space. So what you have to do there, you have to generate synthetic orbits within your parameter space of interest and then search that whole that whole search space. That's very computationally intensive, but we think within reach of present resources, specifically GPUs. We use a lot of GPUs in our exoplanet research down at uh, UFC. So, so in real brief summary, we're saying one of the reasons are the uh, ways to help to solve your problem, close the seven minutes for a gap, energize the amateurs, exploit your current imagery that you have. I've given you some options here. Um, we believe if you exercise some of those options, you could potentially increase the uh, potential candidate list, maybe be four or five new candidates in the time frame that you have an interest in between the 2017-18 launch date. And finally, we think uh, we have the knowledge and experience to uh, help you solve your problems. And I believe that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. Okay, any uh, questions in, in the room? Please raise your hand. Uh, and the mic runners will, will come to you. While, while the mic is going there, uh, Doug, uh, have you gotten any interest or support from the New Zealand government for um, asteroid uh, research or participating in the International Asteroid Warning Network? Uh, we haven't really f uh, formally talked to them. I know that we have the support of the um, Royal Astronomical Society of New Zealand. That's who's heavily involved in the uh, Microfund Network. So we do have their support there. So. Something to work off of. Uh, question about how you would uh, use image stacking uh, for detection versus okay. uh, characterization, okay. and which you would prefer to use it for. Um, we really would like to look at um, detection because we think that's where the greatest leverage can be, as far as trying to find those objects you know buried under, underneath the noise there. So versus characterization, we think the amateurs can do a better job as far as characterization on the detected asteroids that we already know about, so. Okay, thank you, Doug. We need to move on to okay. the next uh, next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is uh, coming to us virtually. It's uh, Ray Pickard from Bathurst Observatory uh, Research Facility in Australia, and he will be speaking to us about uh, small private observatories uh, for obser asteroid observations. Ray, go ahead. Okay, um, good me? afternoon to everyone over there. Um, I'm talking about um, asteroid observations, um, methods and funding, particularly from the point of view of small observatories. Um, hopefully you can see my presentation up there somewhere. Um, now, a little bit about our background, funding problems we've had in the past, um, our ability to get involved, some search methodology, and a little bit of a brief overview of search methodology. Some, some of the problems we have in reporting targets uh, the communication problem, and then we'll have the questions and some contacts if people want to talk to me. Uh, very brief, brief background. Um, our observatory is privately funded, funded pretty much out of my own pocket, and designed to offer outreach and education, particularly to school groups and the uh, general public. We rely on the occasional grant and to keep sort of the observatory available for everyone, we um, operate on voluntary donation basis for people coming to visit us. That really limits the amount of equipment we have available or that we can do research with, but um, primarily I do research on meteorites, 
um, asteroids, comets and imaging um, to engage the general public. Um, I'm a school teacher myself, so designing educational programs around space is one of the things I like to do. Now, funding a very troubled past. We have always wanted to do uh, NEO research in the past um, and even at one stage had a private investor really interested in funding it for us to the point where we had, hopefully you can see on the screen there, a half metre Dow Kirkham telescope designed and constructed for a NEO project. But due to the global financial crisis, our funders pulled out at the last minute and that telescope remains to this day crated and boxed up in Sydney waiting for the day where it will be fully paid for and moved to a site hopefully for that work. And that's about five years ago now, so it's still sitting down there crated and waiting. Um, now, so far as grants go, because we are small and privately operated, we have a lot of trouble um, attracting grants. And uh, what I'm hoping that is if a partnership or some sort of um, research arrangement can be a, a, arranged where we can actually say that we're in partnership with NASA on an a, a asteroid project, that will help attract some of those grants that we seek for equipment. Um, I think a lot of people would like to sort of uh, piggyback on board saying that they're involved with a, a NASA research project as well, and I think that would really help us. Um, I think particularly for us too, um, we have support from the government, um, state and federal governments here in Australia both supported our goal for asteroid research but none have come up with any funding. It's, first of all, go and see what's out there in the, the private sector. Now one of the reasons that um, I think it's important for us to get involved, um, as the previous speaker was talking about, Southern Hemisphere coverage and particularly for us here being able to link with that education um, aspect. In particular, night in Australia, well, day in the US and UK schools, for example. And if we can get a telescope that's internet accessible, um, there will be the opportunity for students over there to, to actually do some follow-up observations or yeah, things like that um, using an internet access telescope during their school hours. Now, so far as the methodology goes, you can either do a random search, so say, for example, I'm imaging galaxies for supernovas or, uh, and things like that, and I happen to spot an object, an example of a random search. Um, targeted, though, is probably more where the amateurs come in. So you know, targeted could be such as the large-scale things of um, random sweeps of the sky looking for um, potential asteroids. It was a dedicated search and following a pattern there. But probably more in the targeted range would be follow-up follow studies of um, potential targets where someone's reported a NEO, one of the larger surveys, and a request goes out for follow-up observations that um, smaller observatories such as us would be able to do that. So some limits, some of the things I think previous talkers were, were mentioning. How quick would a small object transit the sky? And depending on its size, how faint would we be able to image as, as amateurs? Um, how quickly could follow-up observations be made once one of the larger observatories or one of the larger surveys picks up an asteroid? How quickly could such a thing be followed up? Um, and what sort of information would be required you know, for um, information so far as you know, object size, position, and things like that, what sort of thing? Um, example of a targeted survey, it recently asteroid 1998 QE2 passed by Earth fairly closely and a call went out to see whether people could image it, so you know, took up on that challenge and managed to image asteroid 1998 QE2. An example of a targeted thing where you know, such an observation could be used to refine orbits, determine magnitude, position, um, brightness, even rotation, things like that. Example of a random one, sorry about the grainy image on this one, but an example of an object that turned up while I was imaging the Helix Nebula um, as part of a random search. But again, here comes the problem of um, who do I report it to? Um, as mentioned by one of the previous speakers, the MPC kind of frightens off a lot of damages. It's not very user-friendly and people are always worried about making mistakes and reporting. So. In essence, is there a need for, uh, in this project, uh, a clearinghouse central body to report observations to so that um, <clears throat> you're not making errors um, of judgment? Like, for example, the image that I've previously shown, it may actually be a geosynchronous satellite. So do I report that and find out that I've reported a satellite that 
is known about, or do I just sit on it, which is what eventually I did. I reported it to a friend who said, oh, I'm not sure. Um, uh, it would be better if there was an in-between stage where I could submit such an observation and someone could go, yes, yeah, we've followed up that and found that it is a, you know, an asteroid or, no, sorry, that is a satellite. I did check my databases but didn't come up with anything. But um, orbital calculation may be beyond everyday citizen scientists. But, you know, we can report magnitudes, RA deck, time, our locations and things like that. But again, who would be the people that would coordinate such a, uh, an approach? There is um, bodies such as Target Asteroid, I believe, that you know, maybe we could follow up and be part of that. Um, for this sort of system that we're talking about, there needs to be an efficient alert system if um, we're going to be doing um, amateurs, that is, follow-up observations or images of potential targets. There needs to be a quick communication system, an alert system, emails, text messages, I don't know what sort of system there would need to be to let people know these things are out there and provide information about where they could be find them. Hey Ray, you have one I've minute. already mentioned you know, Target Asteroid, which I believe is already funded by NASA, that um, I had to do quite a bit of searching to be able to find these sorts of, of places, that uh, maybe there needs to be one central place where people can find information about these sorts of things. Um, before we throw over the questions, I do have copies, you know, the PDF copies of my full paper about this sort of topic, if anyone's interested. Um, any information, suggestions, help, please feel free to email me. Um, I do have a Facebook page as well. So if anyone um, has any information or wants to offer some suggestions, I'm gladly willing to hear them. Okay. Thank you, Ray, very much. Okay, if there's a yeah, thank you, thank you, Ray. Um, so this is Lindley Johnson. Uh, so you have not uh, attempted to report any observations to the Minor Planet Center. That's right. I'm, I'm, um, yeah, very reluctant to. It seems somewhere yeah, it's very distant from Australia, and usually I report well, them on to to someone else to to um, follow it up for me. Well, actually, I think uh, if you contact the Minor Planet Center and Tim Sparr there, the director, uh, you'll find them very helpful. And helping you get and helping you get started. Uh, there's all that information on the site too uh, that that uh, that can be utilized. I know it can be a little intimidating, but uh, don't let that, that don't let that stop you. There are a number of amateurs around the world that do report observations uh, to the Minor Planet Center, and they find them uh, a lot of them useful. If if you are, do have some problems, so Tim uh, is uh, quite good about uh, helping you straighten it out. Well, thank you for that. Like, I think it's always that, that first go of, of being able to report. Like I say, we do a lot of follow-up observations of NEO. So we use spaceweather.com to try and um, tell us where some of the NEOs that are passing by and try and capture them as images like we did with 1998 QE2. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to move on to the next speaker. Please hold your questions. We will have a Q&A at the end of the session uh, later on this afternoon. So the next speaker is Gary Matthews from Excellus. He'll be talking about leveraging existing one-meter commercial telescopes. Good afternoon. So there's already a production line of 1.1-meter telescopes used for Earth observing, uh, where our concept is to repurpose, though, that design and then some of that hardware uh, for the asteroid detection uh, system. But first, the question is where to look. Um, there's, there's two pieces of this. One, the, the capture part and bringing it back to a, a lunar orbit. The other part is uh, looking for NEOs uh, in the ecliptic plane. There's a, a natural gravity well at L4 and L5. And so um, putting your telescope uh, in an orbit around the sun in, say, L4 might be a, a very good place to, to, uh, to put it. It takes about a year to get there. So on the way there, uh, looking at L4, for example, uh, you could look for uh, NEOs that uh, you would want to capture and bring back. Once you get to L4 and start orbiting the sun, um, you could uh, start the second half of your mission. Uh, so the, uh, the system that we currently have is a scanning system. Uh, so it's a fairly narrow field of view, 0.2 degrees, uh, in what we would call the in-track direction. The other direction is quite large at 1.2 degrees. Um, 
it may not seem like the perfect uh, area imager, but if you think uh, as you orbit the Earth, you have about 17,000 seconds uh, to process about the uh, 0.2 degrees. So you have, uh, with 1,000 second uh, uh, collections, you could capture 17, uh, uh, 17 tiles tall, which uh, equates to about a 20 degree field of view over the period of a year. So you could, you could have a, a picture 20 degrees wide of the eclipt ecliptic plane of the Earth and really look for uh, NEOs in that, uh, in that area. So what would we uh, do? This is a picture of our existing hardware. Uh, we call it uh, NextView, uh, basically the GUI and worldview systems that are uh, in operation now. Um, the Hunter system needs to uh, operate out probably to at least five microns, which implies the system uh, operating more like at 100 Kelvin versus room temperature. So we would convert the ULE mirrors in this system to Fusilica, which operates very nicely at uh, 100 Kelvin and then convert the structures, which are also uh, made to operate at room temperature, to something like a JWST layup, which we understand, uh, which have been tested down to 18 Kelvin. So with those two minor changes in the design, we could basically take uh, the existing concept and move it into uh, a uh, thermal mission. This is existing hardware. Uh, again, the, uh, the aft metering structure there uh, is kind of the rock of Gibraltar. Um, that you see here. Here's the aft metering structure. There's the primary mirror at 1.1 meters. Uh, that would all stay the same. Again, the composites would change uh, and some of the mirror mount pads would, uh, would change, but really no major uh, significant changes to design so we could move very quickly in, uh, in converting. In the focal plane area, again, uh, uh, you see the, the scanning system here, which is uh, very nice for earth absorbing, but not very nice for uh, area uh, imaging. Uh, taking the, uh, the work we've done on the JWST near-spec program, uh, tiling Hawaii 2G's um, 18 micron pixel detectors uh, here in an array such as this, maybe put some CCDs on either end for uh, uh, guiding. And as far as schedule goes, uh, something less than 36 months to, uh, from start to finish uh, to deliver this telescope uh, uh, to the uh, uh, for launch. Uh, so basically, uh, sitting at uh, Sun Earth L4 or 5 is an excellent place. It's a nice gravity well uh, where we could uh, probably find lots of uh, asteroids for retrieval and then parking that out there in L4 or L5 uh, looking for near, or that near Earth asteroids. Uh, leveraging the current 1.1 meter system, uh, that anastigmat, the three meter anastigmat, um, that production line is in place and so cost and schedule uh, could be very much minimized. Uh, uh, collecting or using Hawaii 2G sensors. Uh, really no changes to the optical configuration would allow imaging out to say five microns uh, with a sub three, uh, three year schedule. So that's it, any questions? <laughs> Lindley, do you have anything? Okay, any uh, questions from the room? Um, could you say a few words about the telecon, the downlink of the, uh, and what images you're downloading from the spacecraft? Just, just because you, at L4, you're at a considerable distance from the Earth, so I'm just wondering what your plans are in that area. I could certainly be KA band, um, okay. using the deep space network on, on board, uh, uh, on board uh, storage, could easily, you know, collect for a day, mm -hmm. uh, and then download that all at once, uh, similar to what we're doing with, say, JWST or, or other systems out at, uh, uh, at those kind of uh, distances. Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions from anybody online? No? Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we will move to uh, our next speaker, um, John Lambert from the Boeing Company. Uh, John's going to talk to us about uh, leveraging Boeing expertise, developing space surveillance sensors for the Air Force. Again, uh, for people online virtually, um, you can follow along with the hashtag Find Asteroids and also the chat session on the website www.nasa.gov slash asteroid workshop. Okay. Okay. 
I'll be describing the potential use of the uh, U.S. space surveillance network uh, for follow-up of candidate uh, NEOs, especially for the uh, characterization of uh, both orbital uh, astrometric measurements and physical characterization using light curves and spectra. Uh, it's already been discussed, a uh, number of asteroid search systems exist and are working today to find asteroids. These are specialized systems that uh, have uh, high sensitivity, wide field coverage, and are designed to maintain through their operations a high probability of detection of candidate objects. When an object is detected, you do not necessarily want to break off the search with one of these instruments to follow it up. Your probability of detection and coverage will drop. Uh, Follow-up sensors can offload the characterization measurements uh, on newly detected objects. Uh, they use more conventional astronomical instrumentation, but uh, as has been mentioned, these systems need to be able to come online quickly since you only have a few days on a lot of these NEO candidates to do the follow-up and characterization. And the characterization requires fairly intensive, long uh, observations to obtain light curves and spectra. Uh, one potential candidate for doing these follow-up observations that currently exists and currently has experience in this area is the U.S. Space Surveillance Network. It has a long history of uh, NASA uh, program uh, support uh, including orbital debris program uh, and uh, early NEO observations. The system hasn't really been employed in this mode, NEO observations, for about the past decade at a high level, but prior to that time it was very actively involved. Uh, the system is designed to support uh, unplanned, unscheduled observations that can be rescheduled in real time. The instrumentation is online continuously can very quickly uh, be redirected to uh, new objects. Uh, the infrequent number of candidate NEOs for the ARM program uh, is also uh, highly favorable since it would have minimum impact on the space surveillance network uh, operational mission. Okay, the network is worldwide. It contains uh, a number of uh, radar and optical sensors. The radar sensors are normally used primarily for uh, low Earth orbit coverage. They have limited range. The optical sensors are designed to do faint object detection out to and beyond uh, geosynchronous orbit. Uh, deep space in uh, terms of the Space Surveillance Network implies anything with over a 225 minute orbital period, uh, which also means these sensors, these optical sensors, uh, can slew very quickly so they can track a uh, very close NEO uh, very accurately. The optical sensors fall into several categories. Uh, the dedicated sensors are those whose full-time job is supporting space surveillance. Uh, the uh, prime sensors are ground-based, uh, the ground-based electro-optical deep space surveillance system or GEODS. There are three sites located fairly equally around the Earth. Each site has three one-meter class telescopes with two-degree fields of view. Uh, CCD focal planes, they can do accurate astrometric positions and high-speed light curves. High-speed light curves in terms of the space surveillance is uh, integration times on the order of seconds. Uh, by increasing those integration times, sensitivity of the systems can be uh, increase significantly. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, examples of some of the observations. Uh, GIADS observed uh, NEO uh, 2012 DA14 during the close approach inside the geo belt earlier this year. Uh, it hosted the NEAT uh, sensor. Uh, 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 from 95 to 2000, and uh, it has also supported the gamma ray burst uh, uh, response network, which is a uh, good example of the fast response of this system. 
these uh, gamma ray bursts were detected by sensors on spacecraft, reported to the ground. The goal was to follow up very quickly. Typically, these sensors, GIAT sensors, uh, could be on an object uh, within an hour, a new gamma ray burst source. And uh, uh, more typically, they would wait, uh, have to wait till sunset to, uh, to get to the object. Another dedicated sensor is the space-based space surveillance system. Uh, it is in a uh, sun-synchronous orbit, has a gimbaled optical system with a 30-centimeter aperture. So this is useful for providing uh, daytime observations when a ground site that can observe an NEO is in daylight. Uh, the space-based sensor could conduct observations. A similar Canadian satellite was Sapphire was recently launched earlier this year along with a small satellite with an optical sensor designed for uh, NEO observations, NEOSAT. Okay, larger aperture systems are available through the Air Force Research Lab. These are contributing uh, sensors to the network, which means uh, space surveillance isn't, uh, operational space surveillance isn't their full-time mission. Uh, they are primarily research and de development instruments uh, the two sites are on Maui, uh, the Air Force Maui optical site, and at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, the Starfire optical range. These are three and a half meter class systems. Uh, they have uh, high resolution capability, including at uh, Sapphire, a guide star, laser guide star system, which can uh, correct for atmospheric effects, as well as high speed photometers and uh, LWIR sensors, and uh, an array of supporting telescopes as well. Okay, here are some examples of the data that was collected in support of uh, uh, near-Earth object uh, characterization. Uh, NEO 2002 NY40 is a good example. Uh, we were able to get uh, partially resolved imagery of the satellite uh, be able to collect multiple light curves during the time this object was available. Uh, one thing I want to point out on this is that uh, NY40 uh, had a 20-hour period. Uh, most near-Earth objects are assumed to have fairly fast periods, uh, but uh, uh, this one was slow, which has its own observing challenges. Spectra was collected. We also observed another object, uh, J. 002E3, which was a uh, uh, Apollo upper, upper stage and collected signatures and uh, uh, light curves and spectra on that as well. Okay, there are formal procedures for uh, getting support of the Space Surveillance Network working through STRATCOM. NASA has been through these procedures before. Air Force uh, Research Laboratory, if you can set up a cooperative uh, research program uh, is uh, more flexible in, in their approach. Uh, and uh, Boeing has long experience with these systems and can assist NASA in the process. Thank you, John. <laughs> Lindley, any questions from you? Yeah, hi, hi John. Um, hi, Linda. Thanks, for, uh, thanks for presenting this. As you know, I'm very familiar with uh, uh, most of this uh, these assets. Uh, have you had any recent discussions with uh, Air Force about uh, about use of these assets? Uh, I know um, a few years ago that uh, uh, they uh, basically said they weren't available for this work. But uh, has there been any any change in uh, attitude about that? Uh, yes, uh, I spoke with uh, GIAD's personnel who did that observation of that uh, close approach earlier this year. And especially on a low impact type program, not uh, you know a night to night program, uh, I, I think there is uh, good potential for getting support. And the Air Force Research Laboratory has a long history in this area. And on their research side, uh, uh, based on discussions, uh, we'll have an interest in this as well. Okay. Any other uh, questions from uh, inside the room? Uh, we did have uh, one question um, from uh, Ustream. Uh, so, Lindley, uh, this may be something for, for you to consider. 
A uh, question uh, from Ustreamer848432. Is it possible for one radar to determine size and speed, or would it take at least three as a form of a constellation, as in a three by three triangulation? Um, well, our, I'll go ahead and answer that. We're having some radar presentations a little later on uh, this afternoon. But uh, no, I don't. It, one radar uh, can determine these things. Uh, the advantage that radar provides you is it not only measures the position, but it also measures the change in position, or what we call range rate, uh, which uh, actually gives you uh, three parameter, uh, six parameters to deal with, uh, as opposed to only the three with optical. So, uh, one radar site uh, can uh, provide you uh, a lot more um, uh, information. Uh, about the object than uh, than you can get with optical. Actually, Paul Chodas uh, could probably add to that a little bit. Yeah, I think that uh, I would answer the Ustream question just by saying that um, that uh, that one radar is completely sufficient, and and uh, over time it can observe with such high precision when we feed the orbital. Uh, data through it, we get very accurate orbits. So radar is very powerful, but you need to have a good orbit to start with in order to point the radar. Okay, thank you. Uh, one one more question uh, before we break. One two. Okay, yeah, this is one of those cases I would I would I would guess where we're not necessarily looking at having to get money out of Congress or anything to make a, a real change. And rather than perhaps depending on the, the whim or the attitude of the general in charge at the time, because we know probably the people operating these systems are eager to support the effort, maybe this is the kind of thing that could come from, let's say, the White House or, or somebody else where it would become an ongoing mandate that F AFRL and the other institutions that you mentioned could be sharing this data as part of this effort, uh, just as a thought. Right. Yes, they're, and you know, especially with AFRL, they have a very strong interest in developing new systems that are capable of detecting faint objects, and you know, this this fits right into their program. Uh, it would need to be, you know, a cooperative program to uh, to make NEOs uh, a prime target. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have a 10-minute scheduled break uh, right now, starting at 2.25 p.m. Uh, we will uh, pick up again at 2.35 uh, promptly. So please be in the room uh, well before 2.35. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the first group for keeping us on time. Yes, thank yes. you very much.